Okay. So today I thought that I'd talk about uh, breaking things into multiple files and kind of the uh, what's happening under the hood and the rationale for that. Before I do that, I'd like to go ahead and take some questions if you have a couple for me. Anyone want to ask me something? For the web counter project, um, for our test function, does do we have to make it special that you want us yeah. to do something specific for that, or just make sure that all the functions work? For the test function uh, for main, which is what's going to test your web counter, do I want anything specific? No, I really don't have any specific expectations for that. Just that you do indeed test out all the functionality of it. So there are four functions. Uh, one of the, the, probably if there's any function that you're going to be calling more than any other, it's going to be get, which is going to return the current value of the web counter. And the reason why you're going to call that more than any other function is because you're going to call that function in order to spit to see out whatever the current value is, right? So you'll do reset and then get to see what it looks like. It should look like zero. Do a few hits. Do another get. Print it to see out. It should be have a value equal to the number of hits. Do a set at 3,000. Do another get. Print it out. Confirm that it's at 3,000. Uh, do try. Tripping up set, do a set at negative five, do another get and confirm that it's zero and not negative five, that kind of thing, okay. right? You don't have to do any CNs, you're not taking user input, you're just writing a little test program to run the web counter through its paces. Can you do, isn't there a CN for set? No, there is no CN for set. Keep, so, uh, meaning, meaning a CN inside of the set function? No, like... <coughs> uh, so I'm sorry, would the CN be in the test program or in the web counter? It's it, how you're envisioning it. It's not in the web counter, it's in the set function. Right, the, that's the set function, which is a member function of the web counter. Yeah. No, it would not. And the reason why they're there actually would be no CN statements nor any C out statements in the web counter. And the reason for this is because think of the context of where that web counter is used. It's being used on web pages, right? So you got thousands of lines of code for doing a particular web application and a small part of that is going to be your web counter where when they need to display a page they're going to create a web counter object and they're going to set it to whatever the they read a number from a database and they're going to set your web counter to whatever the previous number of hits are now that a user is visiting a page they're going to call hit on your function you see how there's no C in or C out there because uh, it would be as if you go to a web page and then all of a sudden this little window pops up saying you know give me a number to put on the web counter right what does that mean um, there are no C in or C out statements in the web counter so th that's why I was asking. So some people do ask, well, what about the test program? Should we be asking the user for values to put into this web counter? And my answer to that is, strictly speaking, yeah, you could, but why waste your time? Really, it's a test program that you want to do to make sure your web counter is working. The application developers are going to throw that away, right? And you do not need to interact with the user to confirm that your web counter is behaving correctly. Who cares? Who cares what I think? Test to see if you set it to 3,000. See if it's 3,000. If you set it to negative 5, see that it's 0. If you do reset, see that it's 0, right? Figure out all the possibilities, and you don't need to interact with the user at all. I just type a dot out and it bop, 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 web counter is zero, web counter is this, web counter is that, right? Just a bunch of C out statements and it's done in a fraction of a second. Oh, so you just want us to have a set value for set? Like, 
if, I'm, if you set for a negative number, is it gonna, do you want the function to reset to zero? Based on, so when we did the little role play up here with Luke and Lottie, right. <clears throat> if I said set 3,000 or pick a number, they would turn around and they would write on the board what that number was. If I said set negative 5, we had a little discussion and decided that if a negative, a number less than 0 was provided, we decided in the context of web applications that that was nonsense, you can't visit a page negative times, that you would basically check, you would check the value of the number coming in and if it was a negative number you would set it to 0. Uh, in the screencast, yes. So, it definitely, if you weren't here, it was last time, right? Well, if you weren't here last time. Yeah, I watched it last night. <coughs> you should market that stuff. It's common gold. If you'll sell it to me, I'll give you a 5% commission. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> That's slick. I'll just drive my Porsche up and I'll just roll down the window. You hand me my check. Okay. Right there, I can confirm that indeed my web counter was set to 3000 because it should, when I run this thing, it should say counter is now 3000. If it doesn't, then I clearly have a bug in my web counter code. That's what I mean. It's a test pro. You test all the possibilities. You have four functions reset, set, get, and. Um, Reset, set, hit, hit. Thank you, hit. <clears throat> and and get gets get is tested by virtue of having this line over and over again, right? So I'm going to do something like myvar dot reset. And what should web counter be after I do that? Right. So what you would do, in fact, you might make this output a little bit more informative and say something like, comma should be three thousand. I can do that. All right, so now when you output it, it'll say counter is now, whatever the value is, will be printed, displayed, following by the phrase should be 3,000. So now you can just read it. And here it should be zero. Okay, so that, that's the idea behind the test program. This gets to a, and this will become more important as we work on, excuse me, more complex assignments and larger projects, is this concept of the test program. So the end game is you want a web counter class that is correct. And you do not write the code and turn it in. You write the code and you test it to see that it works right and then you turn it in. Now, as an aside, we are turning in the test program. But as a general axiom, you're going to get uh, to the point where you're developing applications that are several classes. And you don't write several classes worth of code and then try and compile it. What you do is you create the shell, you take the, the smallest, if you will, uh, class, and you build the most skeletal framework for it. Now write a test program that creates one of these. You don't even have enough code in there for it to do anything. Right? I, I can do that. I think I did this in lab. Did something like class, my class, open, close, and then I can in and then in main, so I pretend this is a different file. I can go my class M, whatever. That's enough to actually compile. Okay. Now, you, through the design process, you decided that my class has three or four member functions and three or four pieces of data. Put it in a piece of data, whatever the data is. Again, it all depends on what the requirements are for the particular application. It's, it, uh, I'm a little bit disadvantaged that I don't have a context in that I'm explaining this. But the principle I'm trying to explain 
is that you build this thing uh, incrementally. And you, you shouldn't be adding more than three to five lines of code. After you add three to five lines of code, by golly, you better be getting out of that editor and trying to compile it. Once you have that working, you write three to five more lines of code. You get out of that editor and you try compiling it. Uh, and so when you hit the point where you add three to five lines and you try compiling it and it doesn't compile, it's going to be in those three to five lines where your problem is, right? Over and over again, regardless of how often I say this, people write 80 lines of code and they get 300 errors and they don't know where to begin solving their problem. And the reason is they're not building incrementally. So now, tying this into where I started with the test program, for me to successfully go through that incremental process of development, I have to, every program has to have a main. So I have to write a test program. If you're building, uh, let's take project two, the next project that we'll do, for you to succeed in project two, I would not be surprised if you built at least 10 test programs. You build one just enough to get it to compile and then you either change it or throw it away, depending on what the test program needs, right? It is a program to test code you're writing. <clears throat> and that's the principle here. And, and so in that context, no one cares about the user input, you're just testing some other code, unless, unless the code you're writing itself requires user input and then you're testing that. Um, so that, that, that principle I don't want you to lose track of. Build it incrementally, write a bunch of little test programs. And that, uh, that by the way, is what I'm trying to instill in you through, the, uh, through some of these assignments where I have the, uh, what am I calling it? Try this at home or what is it? additional things to try, or, or things to try, is that what I'm calling it? It's trying to get you to understand that the way you learn a programming language, and this is, for those of you who are computer science students, this is only the first language you're learning, okay? You are probably going to graduate knowing three or four languages. And the way you learn a language is you experiment. You don't just read through the manual front to back and then, okay, I'm going to write my first program. What you do is you write 300,000 little tiny programs to get to understand how the for loops and the while loops and the if statements and the curly braces and whatever the quirks are of the particular language work. So that's my motivation for providing that. It's not because I want to be mean, but because I'm trying to get you in the habit of try, experiment, test, little tiny things until you understand it, then move on. Okay? All right. Uh, so I talked about the test program for Web Counter. Uh, before I move on, any other last minute questions regarding this? Yes? Um, you said on. Um on the project description, it says to make a, a make file and all that. Can you just make the .cpp? Can you just submit the .cpp? Uh, you need to submit a make file. Doesn't it ask you to submit a make file? Yeah. Sure. Yeah, you will have to write a make file. So part of uh, between today and Monday, I want to cover what it means to break your things into multiple files and to use make files to take advantage of that. So that's upcoming. Now I have, we did talk in lab, we talked about make files, and that was in order to ease your process of building five small programs. Uh, what I'll cover actually in class is how to build one, lar quote, large multi-file program using a make file. Do I see a hand over here somewhere? No? Okay, anything else? All right. So I, I want to talk about the process that happens when you type G++ and then some file.cpp. Okay, it's a multi-step process. And in fact, if you have a laptop in front of you, I'd encourage you to follow along. If you don't, then uh, of course you'll have the screencast to refer back to. So let's, let, let me start actually by opening up a, a little bit of a canvas here for me to draw on. All right. Whenever you compile a program, there are actually four steps. There's the preprocessor. Hmm, let me do this. 
Hang on. I'm going to step up my game here. Preprocessor. There is the compiler. <coughs> there is the assembler. And there is the linker. And the order they occur in is top to bottom. So when you say G++ assignment 3.cpp, those four things are actually occurring. And so what you're starting with is, let me see if I'm able to move these a little bit. Uh, what you're starting with is your CPP file, all right? So this is your .CPP file. It is starts at the top. And what I want to talk about first is you go through the preprocessor, and as a result of going through the preprocessor, what you end up with is C++ code. Now that you may be asking, what's the difference? The difference is this is a discrete file here, and this is just a bunch of text. So uh, it's the, and I'm going to elaborate on this a fair amount. I just want to draw the first part of this picture. Okay. So when you type G++ myfile.cpp, the first thing is the preprocessor chews on it for a little bit, and it spits out C++ code, and it's that C++ code that goes to the compiler. So you may be saying, well, I wrote C++ code, so what exactly is the preprocessor doing? So let me start with that. The preprocessor handles anything that begins with a pound sign. Pound include, and if you looked carefully at the coding standards for the first project, it would have had a pound if end if, pound define, and a pound end if, said surrounding header files with that. I'll talk about that a little later. But the one we all know and love is pound include, right? Pound include IO stream. So that is something that the preprocessor actually pays attention to and interprets. Uh, so let me write um, <coughs> lamb.cpp. Mary had a little lamb. Pound include lamb.h. And here's lamb.8. Let me see. So there's lamb.cpp on the bottom half. On the top half, I have lamb.h. And in lamb.h, I will say with fleece as white as snow. Okay. So what I want to do is I want to run this through the preprocessor. It's clearly not C++ code, so if I actually go further than this step and I try to go to the compiler, it's going to be uh, complaining to us. So I just want to do this first step. Now it turns out that the G++ command has options. So you've seen we've used the dash O option. There's actually a dash uppercase E option, and what that option means is only run the preprocessor and do not do anything else. Okay, stop at the preprocessor. So if I do that option and I give it lamb.cpp, here we go. Now there are a bunch of pound, what I'm going to do is I'm going to finesse the discussion and say just avert your eyes and ignore anything that begins with a pound. This information uh, the preprocessor is providing for the compiler, the next step that it's assuming will happen. For our purposes, we can ignore it. Note that here is the Mary had a little lamb. And then what it did is it put a copy of lamb.h right there. So remember me early in the semester saying pound include means literally put a copy of the file right there? Okay, so that is what the preprocessor is doing. So if you ignore everything that begins with a pound, there are only two lines here. Mary had a little lamb with fleece as white as snow. Uh, 
So when I say that the compiler gets C++ code, what it does is it gets a big long stream. All of this stuff is fed into the compiler. So if you're wonder and uh, if you're wondering how many lines of code generally are going into your preprocess or coming out of your preprocessor. So this is just a shell of a program. One, two, three, four, five, six lines. I think I've alluded before that there are a lot of lines here. We can actually measure that. Uh, so I called this code.cpp. It's just an empty shell of a program. If I say G++ minus E code.cpp, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of those lines and I'm going to output them to another utility. I'm getting into the realm of things that would be interesting in a Linux class. It's beyond the scope of this class, so take it as just a little bit of a recipe. This is a program called word count, and the dash L option means give me a count of the number of lines. So this will tell me how many lines the preprocessor is spitting out for this simple empty main program that pound includes IO stream. Wow. <clears throat> okay, so what that tells you is that the IO stream file has in the neighborhood of 37,000 lines in it. Probably, and pr what also, if you were to actually find IO stream on your computer system and open it up, you'd find near the top, it has a bunch of pound include statements. And if you found those files, they would have pound include statements. So there are probably, I don't know, three, three to eight files total that are being included uh, comprising this total. And that's what the preprocessor is doing, just kind of marching through all these files, looking for the things that begin with a pound and get, grabbing a copy of the file. Yes? Does the preprocessor also um, deal with anything that you might be using as well, like using any, any libraries you might be using instead of streams, or just the streams? First? The preprocessor is ignoring anything that does not begin with a pound. Okay. So if I again look at my output here, that means that note that this line did not begin with a pound sign. Again, ignore, ignore all this stuff. This is information intended for the compiler. The preprocessor saw this line. It did not begin with a pound sign. So what the preprocessor does is it just blindly parrots out that line. So we end up with all of your code plus anything like a pound include then causes a copy of additional files to be put at that location. It's sometimes it, another thing to note, and I did this explicitly is that the pound include didn't begin at the top of the file. So that's really by convention and not by uh, edict. All right. So you can put those pound include statements anywhere. They're almost invariably not as useful uh, if you put them in the middle of your file. So they almost always are found at the, the top of the file. Uh, you could use a pound include. So I, I'm going to get to, <coughs> let me make the statement now. Never, ever, ever, again, this is by, I don't want to say convention. I want to say by, uh, you will get in trouble trying to get your code to work if you do this. Do not ever pound include a .cpp file. I guarantee you, if you pound include a .cpp file, you're doing it wrong. And you may get it to work for whatever you're currently doing, but you will run into horrendous problems down the road if you get used to doing that. And we'll eventually get into the whys of that. Uh, but as a general rule, if it has a .h or things like IO stream, which don't have any suffix on them, those are fine to include. Never include a source file. Never include a .cpp file. Okay. All right. Uh, so... That takes us through this next step, <clears throat> or through this first step. The next step is the compiler. This is the thing that actually takes all of that human readable prose that you've written, with, but you've written that, that prose in a very specific syntax. You've made sure that semicolons in, are in certain places and curly braces and parentheses, right? You're following all the rules of the language. If you follow all the rules of the language, then what the compiler does is the compiler does not generate machine readable code. There is another step to the process, which is to uh, spit out what is called assembly code. 
Uh, I'll show you what that looks like. We'll look at it at a couple points. Uh, the way to look at, now I need to go to a different example because lamb.cpp is uh, clearly not C++ code. I'm all, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, I'm going to do this in C. <coughs> so this, all I'm doing is I'm just changing the header file to standard io.h. This is just going to help me not have to wave my hands a little bit further down in the discussion. Uh, but what I'm doing, when I, everything I talk about essentially works exactly the same way in C++. Okay. So what I want to do then is take this simple program here. In fact, let me let me go ahead and write a little bit of code. Uh, I want to create a function called say hi. Seems like I did something similar to that at one point. And the say hi function I just want to do, if you recall in the C world, I use this printf function. Okay. And then I'm going to call that function here. So I'll call the say hi function. So there's my very, very simple program. I want to do, I want to do now the first step and the second step, and I want to stop after the second <coughs> step. And there's an option to do that. And that option is the dash, I want to say S. I don't recall, I think it's, I think it's lowercase s. Let's find out. Uh, oops, oh, also I need to use GCC since I'm using C code. Again, it all works. This option works just fine with C++ code. All right, let's try the uppercase S. There, all right, so is uppercase S. So the, the, these are options you don't have to memorize. Really, the only time you're really going to use them is when you're following along with me. And once you get to really advanced coding stage, then you might use those, come back to those options. But don't worry about having to memorize them. I'm not going to test you on them. You're not going to be using them every day. I'm just trying to, do, to separate all these steps out to help you understand what they're doing. Okay? So the dash E does only the preprocessor. The dash S does the preprocessor and the compiler and does nothing after that. When you get out of the compiler, then what you generate is a .s file. Which is assembly code. And we can look at that. If I do an ls, you'll see that it actually produced a .s file right here. We can look at that. Oops. <coughs> Yuck. Uh, you will if you're a uh, computer science major, an electrical engineering major, uh, you will have a class where you learn some assembly language actually writing this stuff. So what is assembly language? Every uh, organization that produces a computer chip, <coughs> excuse me, a, a central processor, uh, two big ones that come to mind are Intel and Motorola, okay, and there are others. Uh, they all have what are referred to as an assembly language for writing code directly for that chip, okay? And that you can tell, even though this looks like gibberish, you can at least tell that it is human readable. Right? It's not a bunch of zeros and ones because no human on the planet can write programs in nothing but zeros and ones. So this is like the closest you can get to the machine as a human as far as interacting at a code level. Um, and so this, all this assembly language is very specific to the <coughs> Intel chip I have on this computer in front of me. If I go to a, a different uh, chip that's put out by Motorola, then these lines here will look different because the lines are going to be specific to that chip. They'll end up, in the context of what I'm doing, they'll end up saying hi there, but the way you do it is different on every single chip, the way the hardware works. Uh, your cell phone, right, is going to have its own assembly language. Uh, you name it. Anything that's a computing device is going to have a chip with its own language for communicating with that chip. 
So what the assembler is, is the assembler takes assembly language and turns it into something that is readable by the machine. That's what produces the ones and zeros. So that goes into the assembler. And then the output is a dot O, and I would call that an object file. This is the ones and zeros. So the final step, I'll, I want to jump back up here, but the final step is for the object file to go into the linker and what it does, I'll talk in more detail about it, what it does, but at a general level I can say it it makes that object code so that we can run it. This here, this object file doesn't quite have enough information in it for us to run it. It needs to put in some bootstrapping stuff so we can type a dot out at the command line and it knows how to start up properly. Basically some kind of preliminary setup stuff that's needed for the environment. Uh, and that's what produces our a dot out. Now we get a little bit, it's a little bit of a misnomer, but uh, this we now can understand what the historical reason is for a dot out. What that stands for is assembler output. And it's just by virtue of history has been that for 40 or 50 years, however long it's been. All right. So let me talk just a moment about the linker. And let's look at what the assembler uh, is producing. Even though we can't read this, I can point out things that you'll understand. First, let me look at the C code. Again, I wrote a function called say hi, right? And then I'm actually calling that function on line 10 here. So I can look at all of this gibberish here and I can find where that function is. This right here is the beginning of the say hi function. And you can see the word, the comforting word, say hi. And down in Maine, I called say hi, yes? So if I just go down here a little bit, here's where Maine starts. And right here, I'm going to call the function called say hi. And it's this that then jumps up here, runs this code up here labeled say hi. And when it finishes, it comes back down here. We can, I can, uh, if I copy and paste this several times, so I call the function over and over again, and I look at it again, the assembly that it generates, there it is, right? Every time that I copied and pasted, it's calling that function over and over again, okay? So, uh, <clears throat> if the source code for the function is in the exact same file as where the calls are, everything's beautiful and works perfect. But it doesn't always work that way. Sometimes what I do is I create a, a different, maybe I don't want say hi in the same file that I have this in. Maybe I want to put this in a totally different file. So I'm going to say lines three to six, I'm going to write those out to a file called hi there dot c or how about uh, I'll give it the same name say hi dot c okay so here is say hi dot c I can compile that so I say gcc say hi dot c and I'm going to give it that dash s s option so we can see the assembly code uh, oh, I need my, uh, since here's my printf, I need to pound include standard io.h. Okay, so I'm going to compile that. If I look at the say hi.s now, 
we can see here is the source code for that function. It looks exactly the way it did in main, and by golly, it should. But you'll note that nowhere in here is there a, a here's, look at this. Remember me, perhaps you remember me sometime in the past saying, you know, printf's just a function that someone wrote at some point. It is a function that someone wrote at some point, and here's the call to it, okay? So the, all this is part of that say, say hi function. And that's all that's in there. Now let me go back to my my main. Oops. C code C. All right. Uh, now what I have is I have the I have to put this. Does anyone remember what this is called? On line two. It's either a function declaration or. Uh, Another word for it is a, a function prototype. And again, this is information for the compiler saying, hey, should I decide to use this function? This is what it looks like. I have to do that now because the compiler will complain if I don't tell it first. And also I have to do it because it is in a different file now. That is the reason why we have prototypes in function, de function declaration slash prototypes is because we tend to split this stuff up into different files and uh, this is the way I then inform main, or at least line six through nine, that I'm going to be using that function. So let me go ahead and compile gcc minus s. So now I compile the C code.c. Here are the, all the calls to say hi. Here, 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 and here. But if I search for that, that's the only place. What's missing from this file now? There's nothing up here at the top that has a source code to say hi, right? Okay, so let's go back to this picture. So what I uh, have is I have the say hi dot cpp, and I have the that main, which I called C code. So what happens is it'll go through the preprocessor, the compiler, and that's what we're looking at. It's a .s file. So that it'll, it, we can do the third step, which is the assembler, and stop there. That'll create the .o. And I can do the preprocessor, the compiler, and the assembler, and that will create a .o. Now, what do you think the purpose of the linker is? to link them together because I have in one file what file am I in? In one file I have all these calls and in a totally different file I've got where it needs to go to call that function. So the linker is going to take the calls that are here and it's going to link them to where the source is. So if I call it four times, it's going to link them in four places. That's why they call it a linker, because it links things together. Okay. So what happens when you compile more than one file, if I say G++, oh, let me, did I say the option for just doing the first three for preprocessing, compiling, assembling to get the .o? This is the one option that you will use quite a bit. So it's going to be GCC or G++, doesn't matter which one. You do dash C. That means do only the first three steps and do not link. So if I say GCC dash C, uh, say hi, and then I do it to, uh, what is it called, C code dot C. On both of them, I now have a dot O file. So this is the ones and zeros. There it is, all ones and zeros. Now it's starting to make more sense why this will not run by itself. Even though this is all ones and zeros, this can't possibly run by itself because it wants to call the say hi function, and there is no say hi function in this file. Here, this is useless because this has the code to say hi function, but it doesn't do anything. Nothing. There's no main in there to start things off. So we need to combine say hi.o and c code.o into a single 
a dot out. So when we say G++, or G, in my case, GCC, C code dot C, and um, uh, say hi dot C, it create, it. this is a new one, it creates this A dot out, and it is a combination of this dot O and this dot O. So what it did is it started the preprocessor, it did the compiler, it assembled it into a dot O, then it stopped, it completely died, and then it started up all over again with this file, and it did the preprocessor, it did the compiler, it did the assembler to get the dot O, then it stopped, totally died, and then it called the linker and said, please link these two files together into an executable, and that's what created the A dot out. So if you have a file with 1,000 CPP files, then it's going to run these three things 1,000 times for each of those files, and it's only going to run the linker once to take those 1,000 dot O's and put them together into one executable. Uh, and in fact, now that I have the dot O's, I can say GCC, say hi dot O, and C code dot O, and it'll create the executable. What happens is GCC will look at it and will actually see that this is already a dot O, this is already a dot O, and it'll just skip these three steps for both of those and it'll immediately jump to the linker. What happens, so if I, right now, if I say GCC, say hi, dot C, this will not compile, right, because it's missing main. So what, of these four things, which one is going to complain? Of these four, which one's going to complain? It'll compile just fine. It'll create that assembly code just fine. The linker is going to complain because what we're going to have here is it's not going to have a main, right? Let's try it. So this here, whenever we've compiled programs in the past, we've always assumed it's the compiler complaining. Really, you all are getting a lot of problems from the compiler, but occasionally you're making it through all three of these, and it's the linker that's complaining. The dead giveaway is this right here. This is the name of the linker, LD. That's the linker. So this is the linker generating this error, and now it makes a little bit of sense. It's saying, hey, I do not anywhere see main. Okay, it goes, it goes with the other one as well, so uh, let me clear that. What if I try to compile the, the main? So again, main calls C high, uh, calls, excuse me, calls say high like four times, but the source code for say high doesn't exist anywhere. The linker is going to complain about, hey, you're trying to call say high, but I don't see it anywhere, and there you go, undefined symbols. It does not see say hi. And oh, by the way, you referenced it from or you tried to call it from main. That's what that error is telling us. Okay. So this is all very new, and you're still fumbling along trying to get to understand the syntax of the language. But as you get better, you will be head and shoulders above everyone else if you're able to decide whether this error is coming from the compiler or it's coming from the linker. Right? If it's coming from the linker, that means all of your code is syntactically correct. It's just not able to marry up the names. Let me show you a, a typical example of where mistakes can be made. If I do um, <clears throat> uh, yeah, I don't know if I'm going to be able to pull this off. Uh, if I do, because the compiler is probably going to complain here, if I have a typo in there, and I'm not encouraging anything here, so don't go out and be delinquents. Um, I'd have to put this in here, so I can't get I can't get the perfect example. Whoops. So I'm trying to compile both C code and say hi, and you're going and so I compile both of these. And you say, well, I've got both of these here. Why is it complaining? And what, it, what you need to realize is that you've got a typo in your function. Okay, So it's compiling it just fine, but the linker can't find stay high. Why? Because you do not have a function called stay high. It's called say high. And now when I do it, correct the typo, then I get an executable successfully. 
All right. So what uh, I'm going to give you the secret word here in a minute. Uh, what all this ties into then is the make files because it's the make file that helps us with this. We write make files so that if we have a thousand CPP files, it, we make sure the make file does these three on each of the CPP files and then it creates an executable from all the .os using the linker at the end. That's what we would end up using the make file for. Okay. Uh, so with that, I will... Give you the secret word for the day. Apposite, not opposite, apposite. <coughs> yes. Oh, wait, yeah, thanks for reminding me. Did everyone get an announcement that was empty except for a title? I don't know what happened because I typed this message and then last night I was looking at the message I'd sent out and there was no message, just my title. I hope you like the title. Uh, yeah, if you go into um, the course shell, learn.csuchico.edu, and I need to do one of these. And so I will try again like an impatient child because it's time for my birthday cake. I've been waiting all year. All right. Here it is. There we go. So if you go into the course shell and you go into the course and then I think if we go into assignments. So what my message was that I tried to send out that didn't have anything but a title was if you click on assignments. Let me go to student view. And, uh, ooh, boy, this is embarrassing. All right, hang on. Let me go to teacher view. Let's see if it's there at teacher view. Oh, you know, I don't, I don't have it listed there. Uh, this is what I'll do. So right after class, meaning within the next five minutes, is I will put in another folder here that will say midterm exams. And I'll have links to last semester's and the semesters before that midterm exams. So my apologies, that, that entirely falls on, it, actually I'm not to blame, it's Blackboard, I'll just blame technology. Uh, so that'll be there, and I'm happy to take your questions on the midterms that you look at on Monday as well. Okay. The word apposite? <coughs> Yeah, so I asked that question because I wrote this last